Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Karis Templeman. I am a research fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, where I am the program manager of the project on Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, and it's my privilege today to welcome you to our latest event in our Taiwan speaker series on Taiwan's quest for energy security in an era of global instability. Uh, now, before we begin, I wanted to make a few preliminary remarks about this topic. Uh, it may come as a surprise to many in our audience, it certainly did to me when I learned this fact, that about 98% of Taiwan's current energy needs are met through imports. And the vast majority of that is fossil fuel imports, coal, oil, and liquid natural gas. Uh, the remaining roughly 5% is nuclear fuel, and under current policy, uh, Taiwan's last nuclear reactor is set to close for good in 2025. Uh, that will eliminate a stable source of base load that once generated as much as 20% of Taiwan's electricity. Uh, so, so to compensate, the current Taiwan government has pledged to make up some of this energy electricity shortfall by expanding and diversifying its domestic renewable energy sources. They have publicly aimed for an aggressive 20, 30, 50 target by 2025. In other words, 20% renewables, 30% coal, and 50% liquid natural gas. But even if that very aggressive and fairly optimistic target is achieved, Taiwan will still be deeply reliant on imported fossil fuels for its energy for some time to come. Now, that acute dependence on imports raises, uh, in my mind, at least three different concerns that we hope to talk about today. Uh, the first is that Taiwan is exceptionally vulnerable to instability in global energy markets. Uh, and for those in the audience, unless you have been under a rock for the last three months, you will know that we are in one of those periods of instability, driven primarily by the fallout from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Ukraine. Here in the United States, we are relatively insulated from some of those disruptions, at least compared to our, our uh, friends in Europe. Uh, but the increase in prices at the gas pump is certainly noticeable here. Uh, and I'm interested in hearing from our three experts today, who are all based in Taiwan, how that instability is affecting global prices there as well. Uh, the second concern that this overwhelming dependence on imports raises is about Taiwan's carbon emissions and its efforts to combat climate change. Uh, Taiwan's government has pledged to meet a net zero emissions target by 2050. That is only 28 years away. Uh, since Taiwan is an island, meanwhile, uh, meeting that target will almost certainly require a massive expansion of domestic sources of renewable energy and almost certainly significant increases in energy conservation as well. Uh, both of those things uh, are problematic given recent history in Taiwan. Uh, the nascent efforts of policymakers to develop new domestic green energy projects, uh, those efforts have already run into significant political opposition in Taiwan, ranging from the rejection of an offshore wind farm on aviation safety grounds to protests against a solar plant to be built on sensitive wetlands. Conservation, too may be a challenge in Taiwan. Taiwan's electricity rates remain relatively low by international standards, uh, and it's a politically sensitive issue to raise them. The electricity utility Tai Power, or Tai Dian, is a state-owned corporation, and past attempts to raise rates have actually caused considerable political blowback against whoever the administration is in power. Um, a third distinct concern is that electricity consumption has grown by at least 20% over the last decade. Uh, and the large majority of that growth is by industrial users, notably Taiwan's strategically important semiconductor industry. Uh, TSMC, the leader in that industry alone, on its own accounts for roughly 5% of Taiwan's domestic electricity consumption. And that share is set to rise dramatically over the next few years as it ramps up use of extreme ultraviolet lithography or EUV technology. That is a much more energy intensive process for manufacturing cutting edge chips. 
So if you put all of this together, uh, the reform of Taiwan's energy mix starts to look like both an incredibly difficult problem, but also a potentially existential challenge for Taiwan. So to help us understand this challenge today, I'm delighted uh, to have with us three speakers with uh, diverse expertise on the policy and politics of energy in Taiwan. Uh, first, we will hear from Dr. Uh, Kushuan Qian, Qian Kushuan, who is an assistant professor at the, the Institute of Technology Management at National Tsinghua University in Xinju. Now, this is the Tsinghua in Taiwan, not the one across the strait in Beijing. Uh, her research focuses on uh, the socio-technical aspects of Taiwan's energy transition, uh, and particularly on how the state's industrial policies, the pressures from international corporate partners and investors, and the structure of Taiwan's electric power system are shaping the path of Taiwan's uh, nascent energy transition. Uh, next, uh, we'll hear from uh, Mr. Guanting Chen, Chen Guanting, uh, who is currently the Chief Executive Officer of the Taiwan NextGen Foundation. This is a, an NGO based in Taipei and Jiayi. Uh, it's a think tank working to make Taiwan more sustainable, diverse, and inclusive. Uh, prior to this role, uh, Mr. Chen uh, served as the Deputy Spokesperson and Chief Research Officer at the Taipei City Government. Uh, and then finally, we'll hear from Mr. Marcin Yerzhevsky uh, about Taiwan's efforts to strengthen diplomatic cooperation on energy security issues. He is also based in Taipei, where he, he currently serves as the Taipei Office Analyst at the European Values Center for Security Policy. And he is also a research fellow at Taiwan NextGen Foundation with uh, Guan Ting Chen. Uh, he is a scholar of Taiwan European relations, and among other roles, he is a contributor to the Taiwan or the China Observers in Central and Eastern Europe platform of the Czech Association for International Affairs. Um, so finally, before I turn it over to our first speaker, uh, I'd just like to make a process note for those in our audience. Uh, we will have some time for questions after the presentations. Uh, and I invite you to submit a question through the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, and I will do my best uh, to scroll through those and to, to distill them and pose them to our panelists in the uh, limited time we have today for discussion and Q&A. Uh, so with that, uh, I will turn over the floor to Dr. Chen to hear about uh, Taiwan's uh, energy mix and its plans to transform that. Dr. Chen. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Templeman. I mean, and thank you for inviting me here. Um, I'm Kershen Qian. I'm from the you know, National Tsinghua University in Jinzhu, Taiwan. <laughs> so um, my uh, expertise in uh, the energy transition in Taiwan. So today I want to share you now. So the the common concern about you now um, energy security, you know, during the, this you know, path of energy transition in Taiwan. Okay, so before I talk about the energy transition you know, in Taiwan, I want to give a little in, uh, brief introduction about the energy uh, system in Taiwan, energy regime. As uh, Dr. Templeman you know, mentioned earlier, Taiwan's energy system is, is still a state monopoly. It used to be you know, like many other countries you now because it used to be monopolized by the state. Uh, this it make you know, economic sense, you know, have this natural, um, uh, uh, natural monopoly. So we have uh, the state on high power as the sole, uh, sole company for power generation, transmission and distribution in Taiwan. Though it was partially cooperatized in 1990, uh, 1995 and again in uh, 2017, but those are those liberalization are um, having you no know, to these states. Um, um, Taipei power still assume a very dominant power in Taiwan's energy system. So with this kind of centralized network, um, this this kind of centralized network are sort of developed as a way to provide a stable you know, source of economic development because the. Because the chain of command is like here, command of chain is like here. Um, the energy plan of in Taiwan is normally uh, associated with the plan for economic development, which uh, which you know the plan is made by the you know um, the, 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 
the, the, the MOU, Ministry of e Economic, Economic Affairs. So for every couple of years, the Ministry of Economic Affairs, they will make a, a long-term projection about the economic growth and about the GDP growth and the uh, possible growth of you know, um, energy consumption. So uh, both the Bureau of Energy and Thai Power will have to you know, make plans you know, to develop you know, enough you know, power for that kind of growth. So you can see that the whole system is quite centralized. It is aimed for provide us very stable and cheap you know, um, um, electricity for the whole process of industrialization. So you can see that since um, the 1950s, we will see a bit, there's a stable growth both in GDP and um, energy consumption here. So because we need to have a very efficient and stable, you know, cheap uh, supply of electricity. So that makes us extremely uh, depend on our large scale generators like the, the, like the ones used in coal fire power plants and gas, uh, um, and gas fire power plants. So you can see that in uh, 2017, we actually uh, you know, have a huge dependence on the power plant fueled by coal and gas. And some of them, like, we have like 10% from nuclear. So that's the, uh, um, the, the, the energy system in Taiwan until recently. And this kind of uh, state regime uh, sort of faced its crisis um, in two, 2011 you know, after the uh, Fukushima Daiichi nuclear incidents. And though these kind of incidents sort of trigger a strong um, opposition here in Taiwan, um, um, after, you know, so, um, so, so when the, uh, the then opposition party tried to, you know, um, try to, uh, try to respond to those, you know, public concern by having these kind of, um, Phase out of nuclear power you know, in by 2000 uh, uh, by 2025. So the new no the the newly built nuke port actually was halted due to this opposition in 2014. And uh, roughly the same time, there is also a growing uh, concern about air pollution, especially the air pollution from coal fired power plants. So this and on top of those uh, domestic concerns, there are also concerns that with you know, uh, like with um, Paris Agreement, there will be a stronger demand for um, renewable energy and for the product you know, produced by renewable energy. As a country who are at the production end of the global supply chain, there is always a distant concern about whether we can um, you know, manufacture our goods you know, with renewable energy. So those concerns combined together. So uh, the, after the uh, Tsai ing and administration assumed the power, they start to have you know, new energy uh, policy. Uh, especially, they, uh, they pledged to have 20% uh, of new renewable energy by 2025, and they will entirely phase out the nuclear power and they hope to have you no know, a solar PV you no know, by uh, of you no know, 20 gigawatt of solar PV and uh, like 5.5 gigawatt of offshore wind power by then. So you can see that this is actually a quite ambitious plan because um not only we have to uh, uh reduce the dependence on coal and nuclear, we actually have to increase, hugely increase our um, you know, energy generation of uh, renewable energy and uh, natural gas. So the one way to say it is that the, uh, uh, the government, the uh, um, Taiwanese government actually see this kind of energy transition, not only as uh, energy policy, but also as the industry policy, the aim is not only to um, reduce our dependency on fossil fuel, but also hope to foster uh, uh, a new industry, a new, you know, new 
new steam engine for economic growth you know, in Taiwan. So they have these two massive um, projects in Taiwan. One is to, called two-year promotion plan for solar PV, which provides high fitting tariff and um, and they are losing up the regulation about land use and um, and um, illegal um, attachment on the rooftop. So those are the things that, that by having those um, policy in place, they hope to uh, increase you know, the uh, installation of uh, solar PV in Taiwan. And they also have this four year promotion plan for wind power, which, which you know, hope to have you know, 5.5 gigawatts of offshore wind. So what's important about this offshore wind power plant is that because Taiwan don't have a local you know, wind power industry. You know, yet then. So, uh, so by offering high bidding tariff, they hope to attract a uh, foreign investor to have a development project, offshore development project here. And by using policy like local content requirement, they hope to provide new opportunity for local supplier to engage in uh, international supply chain. So you can see that um, along with the growth of um, renewable energy, you know, the, 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 there's a uh, increasing depend on natural gas. So why natural gas? I guess it, because it's a you know, um, energy security discussion. So I, I want to focus on, on natural gas. Now there are more, um, more renewable energy in the electricity system. So that requires more system you know, flexibility to sort of to uh, to sort of uh, contain the fluctuating and the uh, of the renewable energy because we know that they are shipped you know, from day to night and within different seasons. So they need to have some kind of uh, energy supply at hand to um, to 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 maintain the state stable level of uh, power supply. So, um, because they, we don't have the connection to a greater, you know, bigger networks like the European you know, does, or, and we don't have, don't have, we don't, we don't have a sufficient enough, you know, a demand response system and energy storage system. So that makes the Taiwanese you know, electricity system hugely depend on uh, natural gas, especially combined cycle gas turbine, because there's there's some uh, physical you know, feature about this technology. It's quick to respond. It can, you know, reach minimum operating level in 19 minutes compared to, you know, you know, coal-fired steam turbine took you know, hours to do that. So it's much faster, and they can uh, have this low minimum stable generation level, which which means that it could always you not know, run a spinning reserve, so it can always you know be uh, um, being fitted into the system once you know, once needed. So those those kind of dispatchable feature make uh, natural gas a natural fit for um, for Taiwan, Taiwan's energy transition. But this, so you can see that this is the um, commission and and the commission capacity of the uh, Taiwan Power's electrical power system. You can see that for the past few weeks, where we have had many different generator um, decommissioned, we we um, you know, significantly increased our um, employment of a generator that consumes natural gas. So with this, you know, comes a different risk. The first is that. Um, um, with you know, now now we since we said to have like 50% of electricity from natural gas, any kind of supply chain disruption, whether it's from the current situation or the uh, or like in 2013, 2017, we had typhoon to stop LNG the ship, you know, to bring those LNG in. Those are those you know, increase our uh, concern for energy security. And also with the current situation um, in Europe, we can see that you know, the, the, the price of natural gas could be potentially you know, dropping really high and that will affect the electricity price as well. 
And also that um, since that we don't have a, a you know, complementary energy storage or, or dispatch system in place yet, that leaves us uh, leaves our um, electricity system extremely extremely vulnerable. So any you know, if should any generator um, come to any accident, then there will be a system wide disruption. So those are the uh, issues that's about energy security and uh, the energy transition in Taiwan. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you for that, uh, Dr. Chen. Uh, next, we'll turn to uh, Guanting Chen to talk a little bit about the, the politics, domestic politics of Taiwan's uh, struggle to transition away from dependence on fossil fuels. Uh, Dr. Chen. Thank you very much, Dr. Temperman. Um, so I'm assigned to the topic of domestic policy of energy in the case of Taiwan. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I will separate my presentation to three parts. Uh, first, I will cover historical legacies of uh, Taiwan's energy politics, and I will move to direct democracies and energy policy, uh, especially focusing on the recent referendums in 2018 and 2021. And I'll talk about the uh, prospect of uh, Taiwan's energy policies and politics. So before let before we move to Taiwan's energy politics, it's extremely important to understand that all policies are influenced by politics. So um, some politics in Taiwan are highly affected by ideology, um, environmentalism, and anti-nuclear uh, sentiments are rooted in the DNA of the current ruling party, the Democratic Progressive Party. So it's not just an issue of energy security, but um, commitment to the supporters of the political parties as well. As you can see at the middle of the picture, uh, there's a gentleman sitting uh, in the middle. He was the former chairperson of Democratic Progressive Party. At the time, DPP was uh, still an opposition party. And uh, in fact, not uh, he was uh, sitting there to protest uh, get the government and insisting that, uh, that the fourth nuclear power plants uh, need to put to referendum and that people decide whether to keep uh, nuclear power uh, or not. So uh, not just he himself, another uh, former chairperson of DPP and former premier of uh, Taiwan and currently the speaker of the house, the speaker of the parliament of Taiwan, Mr. Yoshi Kun, he himself uh, was also uh, a very active uh, anti-coal power plant movement uh, especially on the, uh, during the 80s and continues to 90s. So the political elites, political leaders of the DPP or the ruling party have uh, legacies of um, environmental initiatives and um, it has become a, a very important element for uh, being a politician in DPP. On the other hand, um, the opposition party right now, the Nationalist Party known as KMT, uh, they lured Taiwan from 1945 to 2000, and again from 2008 to 2016. Uh, they they are considered to be more uh, pro business, pro economic uh, growth, pro economic development. Uh, so you can see there are two different uh, role maps there, and they, they are very they, those are very different ideologies. So besides the environmental movement. Um, that uh, affected our energy politics, that affected our energy policy, it is also very important to understand um, it's not just that. So as you can see at the that part of my slide, uh, it's, um, uh, it's a Yamin's people's anti-nuclear protest. So since we introduced uh, nuclear power to Taiwan at the end, very end of 1970s, early 80s, well, the Taiwanese government decided to store the nuclear waste to uh, the southern east part, the remote island of the southern eastern part of Taiwan. Unfortunately, there is a community living there and it's indigenous uh, people's community there. So it's no longer uh, environmental movement, it's no longer social movement, but also a political movement, a civil, civil rights movement that support the most vulnerable minority in Taiwan. So, um, you can see from the history that 
some of the major political party has experienced this kind of uh, initiatives. So it's very difficult to uh, to 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 state that uh, how uh, the, the energy politics develop uh, within just considering or just discussing the energy security itself. Uh, next. So this kind of uh, uh, trend or political phenomenon uh, movement actually continue in a uh, very recent year and continue to the 21st century. This picture is just shows a campaign to protect a Datan Algal Reef in anticipations of the 2021 referendum. And uh, uh, next picture, please. And uh, as Professor Chen mentioned, uh, the Fukushima uh, incident actually play a very important role on certain energy politics uh, topic. So this is Flake of Taiwan's anti-fourth nuclear power plant movement referencing 2011 Fukushima nuclear uh, disaster. We can probably see that flag very often uh, in the city, uh, in Taipei city. Next slide. Thank you very much. So and I would like to move to the direct democracy and energy policy related to the question in 2018 uh, referendum. As I say, um, energy policies or energy politics is very uh, political salient. And uh, DPP took control uh, of the executive branch. They won the first uh, presidential election ever in 2000, but they did not control the house. So from 2000 to 2008, although uh, at the time, the former President Chen actually uh, stopped uh, constructions or expansions of uh, nuclear power plant forth, but he has no power to discommission them or, or to say, uh, face, uh, facing out all the uh, nuclear uh, power uh, in, uh, before to nuclear file or anything because he has no power to do so. But, and actually it's an excuse for the ruling party at a time as well, because uh, sometimes they have to put into considerations on other politi political issues. Uh, energy is considered to be too sensitive. Unfortunately, well, fortunately uh, for DPP, uh, they took both the House and uh, the executive branch since 2016. So they have to push the agenda. Uh, one of the many agendas they, of the energy policy is to phase out the uh, uh, nuclear power by 2025 and uh, to promote net zero, net zero carbon emissions uh, by 2050. So I will say energy policy has, well, energy policy is dividing the nation. So if you are Pembro camp, you probably would support certain energy policy like nuclear power. If you are a pan green or pro DPPs or the big pan, you probably would um, uh, support the idea to face out uh, nuclear power. So uh, this kind of uh, energy security, energy policy uh, became very, very political salient. And then in the, the opposition party took the chance to uh, push the agenda to uh, to referendum. So as you can see, the questions, um, well, some of the questions are proposed by civic groups, but endorsed by the opposition party. So the two question in 2018, just uh, it's kind of complicated when you look at the, the question, but basically the question was, uh, are you willing to cease expansion of coal power plant? Uh, are you willing to repeal the plan end of nuclear power uh, stations? And next slide. And this is the, the infographic uh, stated here. Um, it's quite obvious that at the time, 20, 2018, uh, the, the ruling party, DVP, uh, had a great setback, and it's actually a landslide victory for both uh, the local election for KMT and for uh, the, the energy policy they endorse. It's very important to know that it's sometimes, uh, well, it's not sometimes, in that case, referendum and elections was uh, launched at the same time. So it's the, both parties are packaging their ideologies together. So including their energy policy, including their politics on cross-street relations, including their um, diplomatic uh, policy um, to both China or to the uh, United States. So they're packaging everything together. So if we win this, we probably would take O. And that's the case in 2018, the KMT um, uh, managed to, that the people approve 
the aforementioned uh, two uh, the aforementioned questions and the, both of the proposal were adopted. Uh, next slide, please. And this shows uh, another questions. And again, uh, both are approved. And next slide. Thank you. Um, so in short, um, things change dramatically. The international environment, international political environment also changed dramatically. Uh, in 2021, uh, some, there are several incidents um, uh, came, came up first, uh, the Hong Kong incident, and then uh, the, the COVID, it's quite obvious. And Taiwanese government uh, controlled COVID quite well at the time. So they regained popularities and it actually gave them momentum to push the political agenda, including the energy policies. Um, so this time, the ruling party learned from the previous referendum, they need more engagement with the voters. They need to explain the very reason uh, why they have this energy mix, why they are expanding uh, LNG or a coal, um, coal fire power plants in order to fill the gap, in order to uh, sustain the energy security of Taiwan. And as you can see from question 17 and question 20, um, next slide. So this time, we have new party people, uh, Taiwan People's Party and others are coming up, uh, being very vocal on these issues as well. Uh, next slide. So uh, both of the uh, proposal were rejected. Um, and next one. Both of the proposal were rejected and uh, after uh, Tsai's uh, landslide uh, victories, uh, so was his um, energy initiatives. So um, uh, as you can see, two, two proposal keeping the third liquid natural gas terminal in Taoyuan out of alcohol uh, reefs was rejected. That is being said they would expand the LNG terminal in Taoyuan in order to fill the gap of the uh, energy when we decided to uh, phase out the nuclear power and um, people reject to restart construction of the fourth nuclear power plant. So this is a right track for DPP's uh, policies to continue to phase out nuclear power before 2025. Next slide. Um, so even within the party, there are some um, different voices, even with uh, at the, uh, within the same county or same city. Uh, if you, not in my backyard, right? If you are living in a place where uh, the nuclear power plant located, you probably are not willing. So both of the uh, re referendums uh, statistics show that the residents in that region uh, going on risk districts are not happy with the, the very idea of nuclear energy or the very idea of nuclear power plant. Uh, next slide. This is the infographic and the number uh, is there. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this gentleman is considered to be the next potential presidential uh, candidate and he is being quite uh, reluctant on uh, showing his opinions uh, or to the energy issues or especially um, uh, nuclear issues because he's the mayor where the nuclear power plant located. Next issue. So uh, next slide, thank you. So I would like to uh, conclude here. Uh, energy issues are highly politicized and uh, environmentalism is kind of like identity politics. So when we discuss, of, uh, when we discuss energy security, it's not, we need to understand that, at least in Taiwan, it's not decided by technocrats. It's not decided by experienced scholars. It's decided by people. So sometimes people are not that aware of the international situation. They are not, not that aware of the, uh, the, the, the energy mix and, and the very reason why we are pursuing that. Uh, so it requires more uh, deliberations uh, indeed. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Tankman. I will stop here. Okay, great. Thank you for that. As you can see from uh, Guanting's presentation, energy issues are, are quite partisan in Taiwan and have been for a long time. I'd like to follow up on that, but first, let me turn it over to uh, Mr. Yuzhevsky uh, for a presentation on Taiwan's uh, foreign relations and its, its efforts to 
uh, secure uh, cooperation on energy supplies. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. And um, in, in my presentation, I will try to shed light on how Taiwan's precarious international status affects its ability to diversify its, um, its, its energy supply. And I believe it's fair to say that diversification has really been the light motive of um, foreign engagements that Taiwan has pursued since uh, Tsai Ing-wen's rise to power in, in 2016. We have seen this manifested in the announcement of the new southbound policy as the flagship foreign policy initiative. Uh, we have also seen it more recently with um, regard to the expansion of ties between um, Taiwan and, uh, and Europe. However, uh, it, Taiwan has also sought to reach out to other partners just outside of these two frameworks, uh, which I have just referenced, also to um, lower its um, vulnerabilities when it comes to its energy supply uh, with very mixed effects, uh, however. I believe that one of the emblematic cases for that was the, was last year's effort to establish a representative office in 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 Guyana, and um, you might wonder why why Guyana uh, has any sort of connection to to the question of energy security. So. Um, the plans to establish the representative office in Guyana coincided uh, time-wise with uh, the discovery of uh, new ample supplies of, uh, of, of, of um, crude oil off of the coast of, of Guyana. Uh, so uh, both uh, the, the, there are two countries in um, the northern part of South America, uh, Guyana and Suriname, uh, which are now uh, competing for, for ownership of these uh, uh, of these crude oil fields. However, um, uh, despite of the, of the border issue, there is a lot of potential to develop uh, uh, this, this kind of very nascent industry uh, in Guyana. And in February of last year, there was a lot of excitement when the Ministry of Foreign Affairs decided to announce that uh, that office was going to be established. It was not an announcement of reciprocal uh, uh, offices, just Taiwan opening a representative office in Guyana. But uh, as you can see in the infographic from um, the uh, Taiwan Economic and Cultural Office in Atlanta, uh, that was essentially considered to be a, a sealed deal. Mm. Uh, however, within 24 hours from that announcement, it turned out not to be a sealed deal at all. Uh, and uh, there has been uh, quite a lot of allegations from the side of uh, Taiwanese stakeholders who sought to assert that um, that was the, uh, the, the decision of Guyanese authorities to revert the decision to allow Taiwan to open a representative office in Georgetown was highly uh, politically motivated. Uh, in, the, in the sense that there was Chinese influence uh, and uh, this kind of uh, reignited the discussion in foreign policy circles in Taipei about the level to which Taiwan should pursue uh, engagement with new partners which are very public because uh, there have been also some voices particularly from uh, the opposition party the Kuomintang saying that if the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, kept a lower profile on the, on the decision to establish for presence in, in, in Guyana, then perhaps the deal wouldn't have fallen through as soon as within uh, 24 hours. And, and there is a lot for Taiwan to, uh, to, to compete for, to fight for in, in its relations with Guyana, given that um, the newly discovered uh, uh, crude oil supplies in the Stabrock block are estimated to exceed the total um, supply available in Norway. So really a lot of oil, a lot of competition. Western players have, uh, have gotten concessions already. There's a strong presence established by Exxon. There's a strong presence established by Shell. Uh, however, it is, it is very likely that uh, CPC after this political fallout will not get uh, any slice of this, of this pie. And this is, this is all to show that um, uh, I, 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 I uh, as I show in my uh, slides uh, later on, I absolutely want to um, echo the point by uh, Professor Tian that when it comes to energy transition, uh, it's a matter of not only energy policy, but also industrial policy. But I think that it's important to emphasize this third component, but it's also about uh, foreign policy in the sense that um, 
foreign policy plays an important role in mitigation of uh, vulnerabilities, uh, volatilities and risks, but also uh, uh, energy transition, uh, which is perhaps not so clear in the case of Guyana, but energy transition is also potentially a source of um, soft power for Taiwan. And this is something that um, has also uh, gotten us interested in the questions of energy at Taiwan Next Gen Foundation. So even though we don't really work on industrial policy per se, we are interested in seeing uh, how those uh, normative uh, ramifications of one country's energy policy, and of course, in our case, Taiwan, uh, could produce reputational uh, effects for it in its, in, in its foreign policy. So uh, yes, uh, Decarbonization and transition to uh, uh, transition away from coal is uh, definitely motivated by pragmatic considerations, as is the case in most uh, economies around the world. Um, decarbonization should uh, help Taiwan uh, um, alleviate some of the sources of, of volatility and also increase its global competitiveness as uh, a number of uh, key players in international supply chains have uh, net zero commitments, but those uh, normative considerations, um, which can be defined as an attempt to, to find uh, um, alignment with, with uh, like-minded partners, uh, as well as contributing to safeguarding of global public goods should not be overlooked. So uh, we have seen in cases of other countries, for example, Germany, that energy transition uh, has been uh, very actively and very explicitly used as a tool of bolstering one country's soft power. And, and, and Germany, with its energy even, uh, serves as a, a case in point here. Uh, Germany has embarked on a series of energy partnerships with, with key players, including, uh, including China and including a number of uh, countries in sub-Saharan Africa. And those, those energy partnerships, uh, which are coordinated um, also in, uh, through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or the uh, Auswärtiges Amt, the Federal, the Federal Foreign Affairs Office, are uh, an important, uh, are an important uh, tool for, for uh, really uh, showing what Germany stands for, not only in terms of people-to-people -people relations, but soft power projection vis-a-vis uh, -vis industrial and vis-a-vis uh, -vis industrial partners. And uh, I would argue that due to, once again, it's, it's very uh, precarious geopolitical status that was aptly described as a geopolitical absurdity. Taiwan might not have enough sway to conclude agreements to the same scale as uh, those energy partnerships concluded by Germany. However, we can see that the German model is echoed to some extent in the way uh, Taiwan tries to incorporate uh, content related to renewable energy in its, um, in its agreement. So uh, here I'm uh, showing you a few examples of energy related MOUs that uh, Taiwan has concluded with its, with its international partners, including Mongolia, which was one of the earliest ones that was uh, that also included a very strong um, capacity building agreement uh, that allowed uh, Mongolian experts to come to Taiwan and also included uh, a promise of a technical delegation that was supposed to be dispatched to Mongolia to, to promote uh, um, uh, sustainable energy there. So um, that's very consistent with Taiwan's broader model of people-centric uh, outreach and creation of not only hard infrastructure, as we see in the case of the Belt and Road Initiative, but more uh, people-centric initiative. Uh, another MOU uh, on energy and minerals was concluded with Australia. Um, then in 2016, another one with the Flanders region of Belgium. Um, so uh, in, in its federal structure, uh, Flanders and Valonia engage with, with, with uh, Taiwan on its own, as well as for the representative office of Belgium. There was another agreement which was concluded not at the level of representative office, but at the level of two uh, NGOs between uh, uh, Taiwanese and Norwegian entities. Uh, and most recently, uh, the British office also concluded an agreement on, re on renewable energy with Taiwan. So. Um, that the normative component is, 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 is definitely there. And then I think it's also worth mentioning that even though Taiwan is, uh, of course, excluded from the UN framework, it has sought to localize uh, commitments to the implementation of sustainable development goals. And um, 
this is uh, visible also with regard to the uh, sustainable development goal related to energy. So um, domestically, Thai power really seeks to emphasize its uh, sustainability objectives. Uh, firstly, with regard to, to the uh, now uh, um, well explained goal of increasing the proportion of self produced energy, but also implementation of uh, smart grids that would um, uh, help with uh, uh, energy storage and also uh, um, expand rapid auxiliary services for uh, for procurement. And then on the in the international realm, we are also seeing that uh, uh, Taiwan is seeking to contribute to to implementation of sustainable development goal number seven. So uh, the poster that you can see on my slide is uh, one of the it, it comes from one of the projects facilitated by ICDF Taiwan's um, a foreign aid NGO backed by the uh, by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that uh, provided microloans to people in the Republic of the Marshall Islands, which is one of the former diplomatic allies of Taiwan, to install solar panels on 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 rooftops. And um, just for the sake of time, I'm I'm, I'm uh, going to move on. So this is this is uh, kind of this conceptualization that I that I mentioned earlier. Yes, it is about energy policy and industrial policy, but I think that in Taiwan uh, there is also this third component of of foreign policy, and the three are inter uh, interacting. And uh, here I allowed myself to uh, uh, cite a, a, a table from from Dr. Chien as well um, about local content requirements because we're I started by discussing the, the good of uh, Taiwan's uh, reputational outreach in terms of um, energy transition, but then there's also the bad and the ugly. And uh, specifically in the context of relations that I focus on in my own work, Taiwan and, and, and Europe, local content requirements in wind energy are uh, one of the most uh, divisive issues. So uh, the local supply chain for wind energy in Taiwan still remains uh, underdeveloped and the government of course has very big ambitions to become one of the regional leaders uh, but at this point the development of wind farms depends heavily on investments and the know-how of uh, mainly European companies uh, there are other players including international consortia but uh, European companies and, and especially uh, Danish companies are very much at the forefront of, of offshore wind in Taiwan and this local content requirement, which, uh, for example, requires uh, uh, the use of not only uh, physical uh, components from Taiwanese suppliers, but also uh, uh, the use of Taiwanese transportation vessels is something that has been uh, extremely uh, contentious. And according to uh, the European stakeholders in the process of the buildup of renewable energy in Taiwan has hindered this process quite considerably. Um, so uh, it, I am now highlighting the 5 plus uh, 2 innovative industries plan, which is one of the uh, flagship uh, economic development policies implemented by the Tsai administration. And as you can see uh, on the left hand side, I list those uh, 5 plus 2 industries that are considered to be a priority. Green energy is among uh, one of them. And um, it is, you, you can really clearly see that offshore wind uh, plays a very important role within the 5 plus 2 innovative industries plan. And then um, in the implementation of the new South One policy, which I also briefly mentioned, the links to the 5 plus 2 innovative industries plans uh, are very clear. So uh, we can also surmise that by, uh, by uh, really maintaining those strict local content requirements, uh, Taiwan is is seeking to uh, be able to participate more actively in the uh, development of uh, green energy, also in the 18 and New South One policy partner countries. But um, again, there is there is a lot of uh, back and forth between uh, foreign investors and and Taiwanese authorities as to whether the local content requirement is really uh, uh, conducive to to achieving this goal, and. Um, the European Union, uh, with its representation on the ground in Taipei, has been uh, going a little bit uh, back and forth on 
uh, how to how to approach this issue. There has been a little bit of a carrot approach, a little bit of a stick approach. So uh, starting with the carrot, uh, the, the, uh, by by now uh, there have already been uh, two EU Taiwan wind power seminars, which are uh, really um, major fora facilitated by uh, both the European uh, um, Economic and Trade Office in Taipei, which is the de facto uh, EU embassy, and the Bureau of Energy of the Ministry of Economic Affairs, which create a platform for, um, for both sides to, to, to discuss uh, mutual engagement in that. Um, I think it was quite interesting in 2021, uh, there have been uh, speakers from the US, so kind of from a, from a third party, uh, from from law firms uh, which are based in the U.S. that spoke explicitly about uh, WTO rules uh, uh, pertaining to local content requirements. So uh, the EU, by putting them on the agenda, really signaled that uh, the excessive local, in their perception, the excessive local content requirement was something of a. a uh, that needed to be addressed by the Taiwanese side, however, without calling them out explicitly or involving European stakeholders to discuss this issue. Uh, but then that was also, um, uh, we saw parallels uh, in, in language deployed by the European Commission, uh, for example, by one of the uh, high ranking officials uh, responsible for the energy portfolio of the European Commission. Uh, who uh, who alluded to the fact that EU might uh, might uh, file formal complaints to WTO uh, mm -hmm. regarding Taiwan's local content requirement and uh, in wind power development. So uh, for the sake of time, I'm I'm going to conclude here. But uh, essentially, the main takeaway that I wanted to bring to you is that uh, foreign policy is inherently linked to energy policy and industrial policy related to energy transition envisioned by the current administration. And um, perhaps because of the uh, situation and, and Taiwan's place in the international system, normat the normative aspect of energy transition plays uh, in a very crucial role, perhaps uh, larger than in other cases that uh, you might be familiar with. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Marcin, for that uh, terrific presentation. We've got a rich uh, collection of material on the floor right now. Um, for the discussion, I'd like to start out with just a, a factual question, and this is probably for Kush. And um, I wanted to ask uh, the 2025 target of 2030-50, so 20% renewables, 30% coal, 50% natural gas, how close is Taiwan actually to meeting that target? And in your view, uh, are they likely to? And in particular, are renewables increasing at a fast enough pace actually to reach the 2025 target by 2025? I think at the uh, beginning of this year, I think it's January, there actually a fierce discussion between uh, the, the executive Yuan, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. and with the, some of the legislators. The, uh, the plan for the, the, the progress of the implementation of solar PV is a, a bit behind because no, uh, so they, uh, they have uh, amended the goal but I haven't seen any official document yet. No, maybe I miss it. But it's very likely we are looking to look at a revised plan. Yeah, in 2025. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, so a, a broader question here. Um, it seems to me that Taiwan for lots of reasons would really benefit from a, a rapid expansion of renewable domestic sources of energy. Um, and it's not clear to me that wind and solar by themselves can make up the, the coming, the looming shortfall in uh, energy. Uh, and so are there other possibilities? Is geothermal a possibility or hydro expansion a possibility to uh, particularly for uh, maintaining a, a higher level base load. Uh, this is probably a question for Kushan again, and then I'll, I'll get to Guanting and, and Martin in a moment. Yes, uh, so far, though we have some small, you know, so small, uh, 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 small progress about geothermal and small hydro, but they are quite you know, few. We are talking about, you know, only 
0.5 percent. You know, mm. those are quite really, really you know, slow progress. And if you look at the policy level, the only the mature technology like you know, wind and solar, they have these kind of only the technology with the prospect of you no know, a dom domesticate um, manufacturing system. You know, though though it's still you know, we still yet to see whether we have for the offshore wind one, of course, but it is actually only those one you know, who who Taiwanese have a prospect to have a local industry that they have a you know, really a, a dedicated you know, pro project about. So those are, I think, for the moment, um, the you know, developer for um, geothermal or small hydro, though they are try to try to get their um, dedicated um, plan, government plan for this kind of development, but we haven't seen it yet. Okay. If, if I can just uh, add uh, something on, on geothermal. So uh, mm -hmm. as a part of our investigations on, on the soft power of, of energy policy, mm -hmm. I uh, had a series of meetings with officials in the Bureau of Energy to specifically discuss geothermal. And geothermal is of particular interest for me as well in the context of Taiwan-Europe relations, because last year saw the opening of Taiwan's very first uh, privately uh, constructed geothermal power plant, the, the Qingshui plant in, in Ilan. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, um, it was developed by, by a Swedish company and uh, a baseline's interest in geothermal energy constitute an important part of the portfolio of uh, European uh, chambers of commerce here uh, here in Taiwan. However, I believe that there's a lot of um, uh, reluctance both within the Bureau of Energy as well as within Thai power to really embrace uh, the power of, of, of geothermal energy. So mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, some of the estimates that I can, I can recall now demonstrate that the total potential uh, energy for, um, for for geothermal is about uh, 100 uh, gigawatts with 33 gigawatts of uh, energy that, that can be uh, effectively utilized. Mm -hmm. However, uh, there, before this a new uh, Qingshui plant that was opened in Ilan, Thai Power previously tried to operate a geothermal power plant in the 90s, but uh, the technology was not sufficient and uh, the, the power plant uh, only uh, brought losses. It was it, it was connected to technological issues and silt um, clogging the wells. And uh, essentially, now when you speak to um, Taiwanese partners, or at least that this uh, something that came up in, in my interviews, is is essentially a litany of of uh, technical issues that Thai Power considers to be irresolvable, like uh, the problem with pH, uh, the problem with with temperature, the problem with depth at which you have to drill. And then you have um, uh, companies that have experience in developing geothermal in other contexts. Uh, you know, beyond Europe, Taiwan has uh, uh, a, a very good economic relations with New Zealand, but has but has really uh, harnessed the power of geothermal in a, in a very productive way. But um, there are a lot of uh, regulatory issues, and essentially, the regulatory framework isn't 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 ready for for geothermal because something that. Uh, the, the Swedish company that I that I refer to mentioned is that uh, th they complained that they had to follow some of the regulations that are um, written for hot spring operators. So I think that geothermal energy is still, uh, to a large extent, conceptualized as yeah. uh, something that's used for recreation and not energy production. Thanks for that, Marcin. Um, so uh, let me ask a, another controversial question. Is nuclear dead for good in Taiwan? Is there any circumstances in which nuclear energy could be part of the mix going forward after 2025? Say, for instance, uh, there's a non-DPP president in power after 2024. Uh, nuclear energy has been a very partisan issue, and obviously the DPP is opposed to nuclear power. Would the KMT, if they came back in, or someone else, reconsider uh, extending the life of nuclear plants in Taiwan. This is probably for uh, Guan Ting. Let's start with you. Thank you, Dr. Temperman. So um, at least um, my opinion, okay, for nuclear power plant, the fourth nuclear power plant is that, but the future of nuclear energy in Taiwan, are we really going to phase out all the nuclear power 
I, I, I think it's still debatable um, because there might be new technology based on nuclear fusions, et cetera. Uh, former president uh, Li Denghui actually liked the idea of uh, uh, nuclear fusions and other high-tech uh, nuclear power uh, generators. Uh, so it's very difficult to tell uh, the, the, the prospects of uh, nuclear energy, uh, but I would say it's slightly possible, but not likely. Okay. Uh, Ke Xuan, is that your assessment as well? Do you think nuclear has a future in Taiwan? I think if we, you know, drawing from uh, uh, Dr. Chen's you know, presentation, we can see that there are some you know, uh, politicians from different, uh, different parties start to uh, create their own narrative about nuclear strikes. So maybe, yeah, in the future, I think I agree with you know, Guan Ting that the, the new core is probably you know, the, the- Thank you, Professor. It's uh, Mr. <laughs> I, I did yeah, not get but... PhD yet, yeah. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I agree with them. Yeah, maybe, but maybe for a different type of you know, technology, maybe a smaller one, more decentralized one, uh, there could be some new discussion in the future. Okay. Uh, one of our uh, audience members raised the, the idea of uh, what he calls, and this is outside of my area of expertise, but small modular reactors. Um, that, oh. Is that the kind of technology you're referring to? Uh, yes, yes. I, I'm not an expert. I didn't have any, but I just learned that myself. I feel mm -hmm. like, I, but I, what I'm trying to say is that I agree that if there's a new technology, then there's a new unplanned territory. You know, if there's a so, you know, like polarized partisanship, right? If there's an unplanned territory, then we may, we may, we may, then we maybe see some you know, politician try to move that area into that area. Ah. Yeah, okay. Um, so let me ask another big question. Uh, Thai power right now is a critical part of Taiwan's energy policies, right? It's the state owned monopoly. It runs the electricity grid and it's also responsible for generating most of Taiwan's electricity. Um, is it possible to reach this renewable energy goal if Thai power remains the state monopoly? Or uh, can you imagine a reform that might make this goal more achievable by breaking up Thai power? Or is that um, not, should that be part of the conversation here? Um, maybe, I, I haven't heard from Mar Marcin yet, uh, let, in a while. Let's go to Marcin first. Yeah. Uh, I believe that an issue with uh, a breakup of Thai power or, or uh, privatization of Thai power, or to be honest, any other uh, state-owned corporation in Taiwan that is responsible for, for critical infrastructure like TRA, which is uh, hotly debated right now following the May 1st strike, mm -hmm. is, is problematic again due to uh, Taiwan's uh, geo, uh, geopolitical status. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the discussions about about privatization of uh, of, of uh, companies overlooking the ski infrastructure take a very different shape when you have uh, so many additional considerations in the realm of um, economic security, and uh, I believe that Taiwan is a model for um, a lot of countries in the uh, in, in 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 the extent of. Uh, 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 conducting investment screenings both inward and out outward and um, uh, privatization could also uh, happen uh, domestically with, um, with with Taiwanese capital. However, uh, uh, questions would remain about uh, about the, the, the safety of the um, both power plants, so the generation side and um, and also 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 the grid. Um, should uh, should the investments be made with what is called uh, uh, as corrosive capital from uh, with, with connections to authoritarian powers? So uh, I understand uh, that there might be uh, a temptation to to move to a more uh, market based model with a lower role of the state. Uh, however, I think that in the particular case of Taiwan, um, it is it is important to to maintain. Um, this kind of level of of, uh, 
of scrutiny in a sense that that comes with with the with the state owned uh, component uh, that being said i think that uh, reforms are needed within uh, within thai power to allow for uh, more innovation and for more uh, international outreach so just to kind of uh, circle back to the example of geothermal there are um, investors who are who are willing to engage in geothermal projects who see uh, potential for geothermal perhaps to a larger extent uh, than Thai power. So uh, th those kind of um, exchanges are needed. And uh, th there is um, there is something that uh, has been mentioned that I, I didn't get to, that was my slides, but uh, uh, the European Chamber of Commerce Taiwan always dedicates a, a considerable chunk of their, of their annual position paper on wind energy and generally energy and environment issues. And something mm -hmm. that came up once again in, 20, in the 2022 position paper is the um, role of um, regulation in the energy sector. So I understand that your question is about uh, Thai power very specifically, but in general, when it comes to issues of both ge generation, and, and uh, grid development, there are a lot of other actors uh, at play. So uh, with, with offshore wind, there's the uh, question of the, of the port authority and the Ministry of Transportation and Communications, and then uh, different bureaus under the Ministry of Economic Affairs. So there isn't really a lot of uh, coordination between, between those agencies, and that seems to be a perennial issue in, in hindering innovation in Taiwan. So, um, here, I, I, I would disagree with the need to, to privatize or split up Thai power, but I would echo the, the, the sentiment expressed by the, by the chamber that calls for an establishment of a platform that would be managed directly by the executive UN, that would be kind of like a special task force. Uh, they draw a comparison to uh, CCC with the Central Epidemic Command Center. So they are essentially calling for like a central renewable energy command center. Okay. And uh, I, I think that there is a there is a logic to it. So we need more coordination and we need more inclusivity for, for different stakeholders. And Thai power would of course play an important role in that kind of platform. Okay, that's really interesting. Thanks for that, uh, Marcin. Uh, Guanting or Kushen, uh, anything you'd like to add on this question? Well, I think I agree with much entirely. I think it would be you no, know, it would be sort of naive to feel like you no know, um, privatization, privatize of Thai power will stop everything, make everything go away. I think one temptation for uh, for the private liberalization of uh, electric the market for electricity is is to have a more depoliticalized mechanism for price setting. I think one of the temptation is always liquid and there's a chance to you know, create some incentive for new player in the place. But do we have to achieve that through the you know, privatization of Thai power? I think you know, that's not a necess necessarily means. Um, well, let me pick up on that thread, that comment about uh, setting electricity prices and note that we've talked mostly about the supply side so far in our conversation. I wonder if we could talk a bit about the demand side, the, the rising demand, especially among industrial users for uh, electricity in Taiwan and whether you think it's possible uh, and perhaps how uh, Taiwanese authorities might uh, encourage conservation among the major users of electricity in Taiwan. Um, let's see, uh, Ko Shren, this is probably in your wheelhouse. Let's start with you. <laughs> I think in, so far we have some policy like mandates, like Yong Dian Da Hong Chao Pai, to urge you know, the, uh, the any user who have like more than 5,000 who have the contract capacity of more than 500, five megawatts. Mm. So we urge them to take some kind of measure, either invest in renewable energy you know, installation or purchase some kind of you know, renewable energy certificate or having their own energy storage device. I think those are, mm. uh, for now, it sort of achieved through mandates because the cost of electricity still, is, you know, the price is still relatively low. It's hard to get any kind other type of incentive for this type of 
thing. But but I think if if we if we want to have a have an effective uh, de demand side response, we may have to uh, create more um, no, utility wide market you know, incentive for, for people to deploy more renewable energy. Mm, okay. So uh, let me ask what would happen if the Tsai administration said, we're in an energy crisis, we need to double electricity rates. Uh, what would be the response? <laughs> Could they do that politically, or would that be too costly politically to attempt? <laughs> Guanting, you're you've had some experience in politics. What's your take uh, on this? Well, if he if she chose to do that, um, depends on the rate. But if exactly what you say, like two hundred percent, then we will lose the local election this year, and we will lose the presidential election the year after. Okay. So, uh, but wow. but but let's say. If, it's gradual, or if it's not focusing on the normal season, but focus on industrial sectors, things might be very different. So um, as Professor Chen's um, uh, picture infographic show, right, um, industrial part of accounted for like more than 56% of our, uh, uh, for, for the whole energy sector. So it's the industrial part sectors that are consuming the most, so if we focus on that area, if we focus on that field and ask, ask the industrial, I mean, the big corporates or big business to pay for, to increase their uh, in electricity rate, it might work. It might not have um, political, um, co co political uh, factors to the election. So it really depends on whom to tax or whom to uh, increase the rate. Uh, Marcin, do you have any uh, thing you would like to add on this question? Yeah, so uh, I, I mean, I understand why we might be focusing when when talking about the demand side, why we might be focusing on industrial consumers, and uh, given that uh, they take up more than sixty percent of the energy produced in Taiwan. But I I believe that the um, government also has a series of tools that could be uh, deployed to lower energy consumption at uh, uh, at residential level, and I think that uh, one of the one of the questions that is uh, not uh, receiving as much attention as it should is the question of of uh, uh, thermal insulation of of buildings in Taiwan. Uh, that is usually mm. um, a, a, a rather understated issue. However, uh, with uh, the the climate crisis and, and and rising temperatures the the use of air conditioners in Taiwan will increase and therefore insulation uh, with regard to limiting heat gain uh, is an important issue uh, we are seeing that the government is um, embracing the the higher use of air conditioners in public institutions for example so one of the uh, flagship uh, uh, commitments of uh, uh, Yoshi Quan is is installation of air conditioners in every classroom, uh, but then uh, that policy isn't doesn't really go hand in hand with ensuring that the use of this uh, of of air, air conditioners in classrooms or in once again residential context is is really effective. So I think that. Uh, uh, that there are there are tools uh, that could be deployed uh, again subsidies for uh, for installation of houses subsidies for installation of more uh, energy efficient air conditioners so um, there's there's still a lot to be done also in the in the residential realm great um, we've got just about five minutes left uh, so I want to pose a question from one of our audience members um, about what I consider to be the elephant in the room in this discussion of security, uh, energy security, and that is, if there is a conflict with the People's Republic of China, Taiwan's uh, overwhelming reliance on foreign energy imports is a huge security vulnerability. Uh, and one way in the near term to, uh, to mitigate that vulnerability a bit is to develop some real reserve supplies of fossil fuels. So um, one of our questioners notes that uh, Latvia has used underground storage technology to maintain approximately a two-year supply of natural gas consumption 
Uh, and I wonder if Taiwan, to your knowledge, has uh, considered building up a kind of strategic reserve of oil, coal, and gas uh, in the near term, uh, just to prevent that kind of uh, intervention or, or a disruption to supplies from immediately crippling the economy. Um, Kleshren, do you know, do you have any thoughts on this? <laughs> I only know that the Bureau of Energy had this uh, plan for, you know, having CPC, Zhongyu, to have this kind of um, increase their reserve for uh, LNG, because now well, now we only have uh, 15 day to 16 day of re reserves. No, that's the mandatory. Uh, that's the that's the, uh, the the amount we can store it. But and we hope to 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 increase that to you know, like 24 day. But that is not not that secure after all, I guess. So that's the only plan I know for now. As if you no, know, there's a more long term, you know, large scale. On the ground storage, I haven't, I haven't got the, any uh, Great. Great. information uh, about that. Guan Ting or Martin, uh, any thoughts on this? Um, my opinion is very similar to Professor Chen. Um, according to what I heard back in uh, 2017, when I was a, a researcher at NS National Security Council, this is being addressed. It has been addressed, but I'm hearing about days, not months. So if we are, um, if we will unfortunately be in experience the blockade from uh, PRC, uh, we probably need to rethink about uh, how to reserve those energy. And I just want to bring out that uh, it's extremely difficult because I remember the referendum that I mentioned uh, in my presentation, even if, um, even we wanted to expand the, just the LNG terminal in Taoyuan, we have experienced <laughs> that much uh, difficulties um, imagine something else. Um, this might cause uh, a lot of um, uh, criticisms. So, uh, but again, this is necessary. Okay. Uh, Marcin, we'll uh, conclude with you today. Any final thoughts? I mean, I, I don't really have uh, much to add specifically on the on the storage question, but I believe that this is an important uh, piece of, of infrastructure that needs to be developed along with the uh, uh, above the ambition to to increase the share of uh, gas in the in the overall energy composition, but also um, energy storage is is an issue for um, not not only for fuels but also for uh, for renewables. So that's definitely another dimension to uh, to consider in this energy transition that hasn't been addressed adequately as of yet. Great. Well, I, I apologize for not having more time to talk about this very important issue today, uh, but I do want to thank all three of you for getting up very early Taipei time to join us here on the West Coast. Um, and I hope this is the start of a broader set of conversations about these very important issues facing Taiwan. Um, I also thank our audience for tuning in, uh, and I just remind you, you've been watching uh, the project on Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific region, our regular speaker series coming to you from the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. Uh, I'm Karis Templeman. Uh, you've been listening to Martin Yershevsky, uh, Kirshan Tian, and Guanting Chen uh, coming to us this morning from Taipei, Taiwan. Uh, thanks all, and I wish you a good rest of the day over there in Taipei uh, or wherever you may be. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.